Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, and as I said, we are going to be watching a video from Swag Kage talking about the third grade ninja war. Now, we already watched a video by him talking about the first grade ninja war, and then the second grade ninja war, and now we're watching the third grade ninja war. Like I said, and anyway, like I also said, these videos will be coming out in succession. The first one, uh, the first grade ninja war should be out first, and then the second grade ninja war uh, video should be out second, and then this one should be next after that. And then, like I said, we also have another video from Swag Kage about about Naruto and then we're going to be switching franchises so with all that said let's go ahead let me just put them on my headphones check the volume full screen and play hey fellas how's it going Swankage here and today we're going to be wrapping up my little ninja war mini series by taking a look at the this third one grade I feel like war, we have a lot more information off screen so out of all of Naruto's global conflicts with the exception of course of the fourth grade mm -hmm. ninja war this is the one that we know the most about or it's at least the one that we're told the most about directly we're never told exactly how much time passes between the end of the second war and the start of this one but I'd assume it's around the 10 to 15 year range since Nagato Yahiko and Conan seem to be about that much older. Again, this is just a guess. Like I said, we don't actually know. But what I can say for sure is that the war did take place at least 10 to 15 years before the start of the series, since it obviously precedes the Nine Tails attack and, mm -hmm. by extension, Minato's death, both of which happened the day Naruto was born. Speaking of Minato, as I'm sure many of you already know, he was a pretty big deal throughout this war. Like Tsunade in the second war before him, Minato was probably Konoha's most valuable asset. His skill with the flying Raijin Jutsu made him engaging him almost impossible, and conversely allowed him to quickly and efficiently tear through enemy forces. Even two of the fastest ninja in the world, the future <laughs> fourth Raikage A and the Eight Tails Jinchuriki Killer B struggled to keep up with him. As a matter of fact, I think it'd be more accurate to say that he easily outpaced both of them at the same time. So to the average ninja, which made up the overwhelming majority of the military forces participating in this war, Minato was probably pretty scary. He was given the nickname the Yellow Flash, and at some point the Stone Village even ordered all of its troops troops to flee on sight if they were ever unlucky enough to run into him. One of his most notable accomplishments came during the mission to destroy Kanabi Bridge, which at the time was an extremely important bridge used by the Stone Village to transfer supplies to its troops stationed in the Grass Village. At some point during the mission, a group of Leaf Ninja made contact with a group of enemy Stone Ninja, and the resulting battle left them in a pretty undesirable position. By the time Minato showed up, the Leaf's forces had been reduced to a measly four people who were mm -hmm. being pinned down by at least 50 Stone Ninja. Now, we're never actually shown this, but it's heavily implied that Minato took out all 50 of these guys by himself, and it's due in large part to this victory that Konoha was able to successfully carry out the mission to destroy Kanabi Bridge. Now, this mission success was actually a pretty big deal, and is often cited as one of the main reasons the Leaf was able to turn its losing position into a winning one. But in order to explain why, let me take a step back and give everyone some context. So, as usual, we're kept in the dark about a lot of the war's finer details, but in Chapter 239, we do learn quite a bit about what was going on between the Leaf and the stone specifically. This doesn't seem to be what initiated the war since the Minato flee on sight order had already been issued, but at some point the stone village invaded the hidden grass village and the leaf caught wind of this. Now this was a problem because the hidden grass rests right on the border of the land of fire, and at least according to Minato's intel, the hidden stone had already sent at least a thousand shinobi to invade it. So this was obviously a pretty aggressive attempt on behalf of the hidden stone to capture the hidden grass village and use it to make launching a full-scale invasion on the land of fire easier. According to an exposition blurb at the beginning of the chapter, this sort of thing was fairly common, or it was at least fairly common for fighting to take place in small villages located between the five great nations, mm -hmm. just like Nagato said to Naruto. Now, the cause for the war is fairly vague. All we really know is there was some sort of power vacuum or something in close proximity to the leadership of the five great nations that led to a great deal of political instability, and just like that, everyone was back at each other's throats again. This initially led to a bunch of fighting near, but not actually inside, national borders which of course eventually and inevitably ended up involving a bunch of small villages located near these borders. The leaf and stone fighting across the hidden grass village is the only example of this that we know of, but it's bound to have happened elsewhere since all five shinobi countries took part in this war. Anyway, the reason the destruction of Kanabi Bridge was so important is because without it, the stone village troops stationed in the grass village effectively had their access to their village's resources cut off completely. This obviously would have forced them to retreat back to the land of earth, which by extension would have made invading the 
the Land of Fire significantly more difficult. Now, it is worth clarifying that Minato himself didn't destroy Kanabi Bridge. Kakashi, Obito, and Rin were tasked with this, while Minato engaged the Stone Village on the front lines. On the team's way to the bridge, Rin was captured, and when the other mm -hmm. two tried to rescue her, a battle ensued where Obito was thought to have died. It was also at this point that Kakashi received his Sharingan, which he seems to have put to pretty good use since later on in the war he earned the nickname the Copy Ninja. Now, while these Kakashi Gaiden chapters do give us a pretty in-depth look at the war, at least from one angle, we never really get to revisit it with the same level of detail. Most of the other stuff we know about the war comes from very brief flashbacks or short exposition snippets. We do get a follow-up to these chapters later on when Toby's identity is revealed, but focuses a lot more on Obito's interactions with Madara than on the war going on outside the cave. Fortunately, we are shown something pretty major during this flashback mm -hmm. series, Oof. Rin's death, which is tragically at the hands of Kakashi. Now, since we've all already seen this, I don't think I really need to go over it, but I would like to focus on a lot of the background details here. So first of all, Kakashi and Rin were fighting ninja from the Mist Village, and since we already confirmed that both the Stone and the Cloud Villages took part in this war, this is the fourth of the five great nations that we've been able to identify as an active participant. Now, what's a lot more interesting than the Mist's involvement is what they were planning to do here. As I'm sure many of you remember, Kakashi only killed Rin because she asked him to. And this was because she'd recently been turned into the Three Tails Jinshiriki by the Mist Village, and they were gonna pretend to pursue Kakashi and Rin all the way back to the Land of Fire, and then as soon as she set foot into the Leaf Village, bam, they were gonna release the Three Tails and wipe Konoha out without even having to launch an invasion. Now obviously this tells us a little bit more about just how depraved the Mist Village used to be, but it also lets us infer which Mizukage was in power at this point. In my video about the First Great Ninja War, I explained that the deathmatch between the Second Mizukage and the Second Tsuchikage must have taken place during the First War, since the first person that Mu assumes revived him is Tobirama, who also died during the same war. We also mm -hmm. know that the Fourth Mizukage Yagura was the Jinchuriki of the Three Tails, and while we're never told exactly how long it takes Biju to reincarnate after they're killed, since the Raikage was willing to kill Naruto to put the Fourth War on hold for a while, I'd imagine that it's at least a little while. Yagura was also pretty infamous for being a tyrant, but we later find out that this was only because he was being controlled by Obito. At this point, though, Obito had only just left the cave where Madara fixed him up, so I think it's pretty safe to say that Yagura didn't become Mizukage until much later. This should mean that the person in charge of the Mist Village throughout this war was the third Mizukage, but aside from his title, I can't really tell you anything about the guy. We, we don't, don't know anything. We, we, don't, we don't even know his name. Fun coincidence, actually, the third Kage of every village should have been in power when this war started. We know pretty much beyond a shadow of a doubt that Hiruzen and Onoki led the Leaf and Stone villages at this point, respectively, and it's stated that the third Raikage died during this war as well. And since I just explained why the third Mizukage should have been in charge of the Mist, that just leaves the Sand Village. So we know that Sasori actually participated in the Third Great Ninja War, and that's where he got the title uh, Sasori of the Red Sand. The story behind the nickname is actually pretty simple. It's who who made this picture cuz that um that looks you know, let's just move Not on. Not because of Sasori's red hair, or because he was raised in a place with naturally red sand. He just killed a lot of people throughout this war, and their blood tended to get all over the place. Anyway, at some point after his service, he defected from the Sand Village, and it was after this that he killed the third Kaze Kage. I think it's also worth mentioning that Chio lays out a very clear passage of time between when Sasori defected from the Sand Village and when the third Kaze Kage disappeared, so I'm pretty comfortable saying that this guy was running things while the third war was was going on. As for everything else that happened during this war, at least the stuff we know, it's either minor or only tangentially related to the war. We do know, according to one of the Itachi Light novels, that a ceasefire agreement between the Leaf and Stone villages was enough to bring the war to an end, and we also know that since Hiruzen didn't seek reparations from any of the other participants after the war's conclusion, he ended up making a lot of residents of the Land of Fire really mad, and so in order to appease everybody, he stepped down as Hokage and gave the job to Minato. Now this, the act of making Minato Hokage caused a lot of internal village drama, specifically between the Uchiha clan and the village's administration, but I'll save that for another video sometime in the future. Now real quick before I get out of here, uh, if you'd be so kind as to spare me a little bit more of your time, I'd like to plug a personal project of mine. Mm. Some of you may remember the last time I attempted to do something like this, but uh, recently I have been working on publishing a webcomic. Currently only two 
Thank you. chapters are out. Production has been pretty slow. But I'm pretty proud of both of them. I think they're both fantastic. Due in large part to my incredible artist, a guy called Jacob Noble. I'll leave a link to his Instagram in the description. But the main reason I haven't been able to crank out chapters as quickly as I'd like to is because of the lack of a financial incentive for my artist. Now, don't get me wrong. He's super invested in the project. But it's one of those things where, like, I can't expect him to work full-time without yeah. a full-time salary. And I've been doing my best to pay him what I can. But since I'm only one person and the webcomic isn't making any money, that's a little bit easier said than done. Now, uh, a week or so ago, I started up a Patreon page. So if you're interested at all in the webcomic, you can just check it out for free. You don't have to give the Patreon a second thought. But if you do like it enough that you want to support it and speed up production, I'm going to leave a link to the Patreon in the description as well. Don't feel pressured to. I just figured I'd mention it. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching. Take care. Yeah. It's the end of the video. Okay, so yeah, there it is. Um, the third great ninja war. Now, like you said, this is the one that we know the most about. But even then, it's like, we still barely know anything. And it's, I mentioned this in the previous video, where we talked, where we watched the video about him talking about the second great ninja war arc, but, no, war arc, because it wasn't an actual arc, it was just the second great ninja war. But one thing that I thought was, was kind of disappointing, I think this is, I, I think I share the opinion of a lot of people in the uh, Naruto fandom, but, you know, this this world that Kishimoto built is very, very interesting, but the problem is he barely explores it. I mean, he does explore it a bit more in the fourth grade Ninja War arc, but not really enough to to sort of, I guess I should say, satisfy most of his fans. If that, if that makes, if that's the right thing to say. But anyway, um, yeah, so look, uh, like you said, uh, Third Grand Ninja War is where, you know, uh, and this is where a lot of prominent characters, uh, like some, or not a lot of, some prominent characters do make their appearance. Like, for example, uh, this is where we see Minato in action. Uh, this is where we see Kakashi in his younger days. And, you know, knowing what he went through when he was young does kind of explain uh, some things about him as an adult, why he always spends a lot of time in the uh, oh god, what's it called the, the the stone graveyard, where a lot of Shinobi's names get uh, get carved up, people who lost their um, people who lost their lives, and yeah, it's just it, it does explain a lot of the things that um, that happen in the main story, you know, a lot of the main antagonists. A lot of their motivations came from the fact that they grew up in a time where there was just a lot of war around go in the world, you know. And everyone knows that whenever there's war, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of grief, there's a lot of strife, and people have animosity towards the uh, villages that caused them that pain. Like for example, Nagato has, uh, you know, hatred for the Leaf Village because they're the ones responsible for taking away his parents. And he had, of course, hatred for Hanzo because he was responsible for Yahiko's death. And it's just, it's what caused them to do the things that they did. And it does, it, it, it does kind of suck. And to me, it's one of the things that made the villains in Naruto so interesting is because they had understandable motives. Not that you agreed with them. Let me make it clear. You didn't agree with what they were doing, but you understood where they were coming from. You understood why they were the way they were. And for me, the reason why... And, and I know I've brought this up in a lot of other videos, but the reason for me why Boruto just hasn't been compelling at all, and this is of course nothing against people who do enjoy it, I'm happy you enjoy it, more power to you, but for me one of the reasons why Boruto just, just feels so underwhelming is that the villains that they're going up against are just, like, they're, they're, they're boring, you, you, you can't really understand their motives at all, well you, you can in a way, but not to the extent that you did the villains of uh, Naruto, uh, like, for example, uh, just to get, again, this is just an example, but, you know, a lot of people praise Ishiki, but for me, other than his power, what exactly is it about him that was so compelling? Like, seriously, what, what, what is it about him that people found so fascinating? Again, other than his power, other than that, really tell me, what about him as a person? that people found so compelling because I just I, 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 I know everything that happened I was there as the chapters were being released I just I, I don't get it what 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 is it 
And, and even later, after he... Uh, sorry, I guess spoilers for the Boruto manga, but after he died, we find out his goal, and his goal is just just absorb more planets until he becomes like an Otsutsuki god thing or whatever. But after that, like, what then? What's what's your real goal? It's just that that's so, that's so boring. That just that that's, that seems so boring. It's just I want to be powerful. That's it. That's all you want. Like that's just that's just that's not interesting. Not, not even a little bit. I don't know. It's just it, to me. I just. And then of course you have Code, who, honestly, his goal feels like just just a ripoff of Sasuke's goal from part one of Naruto, where now he just wants revenge. And, well, the only thing that's even kind of remotely interesting is Ada, and Ada. The thing is, we don't even know. I mean, she also kind of wants revenge, but this this time it's against Amado because of, I guess he she hates him for modifying her and making her into a. Uh, uh, a, a, a cyborg uh, it's just okay that's that's fine but I don't know it's just to me like the the, the, the villains or antagonists and boards are just so goddamn boring they're not compelling at all and I just I, I honestly don't get what so many people see in them now look this isn't a slight against anyone who does of course like I said I'm happy you enjoyed more power to you but I just I don't get it I don't I feel like a lot of people share the same opinions me anyway guys that's all i have to say uh, thank you so much for watching and or listening remember to like the video share the video and hey if you want maybe you can go check out the uh, web the webcomic that swakag is working on of course you he already told you where to find it in this uh, this video and like i said in the previous video if you want to, if you have a video that you guys want that you want me to watch and react to uh, let me know about it in the comments and let me know by just leaving the title of the video and the YouTube channel that posted it because I don't know why but whenever you whenever someone tries to leave a link to the video in the comments for some reason YouTube removes it I don't know what's going on so just leave the title and the YouTube channel that posted it so I know where to find it anyway that's all I have to say guys uh, remember to also remember to subscribe if you're new here and click on the bell icon because that will help my channel with the algorithm remember to stay safe and take care of yourselves and please join me for the next video bye for now